This is the web transcription service of the Royal Canadian Military Institute. On Thursday, May 1st, Canadian historian Sarah Kahn of Wilfrid Laurier University and Queen's University delivered a talk to our monthly Military History Night on Music is a National Necessity, in which she explores Anglo-Canadian popular songs composed on the home front between 1914 and 1918. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, a warm welcome, Sarah, and the floor is yours. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to begin by thanking the Royal Canadian Military Institute for inviting me to speak here tonight. I hope everyone enjoyed their dinner, and now for some musical entertainment. Popular songs provided a soundtrack for the First World War. Soldiers sang or whistled familiar songs as they marched, and composed clever parodies to escape the monotony of everyday life in the trenches. But songs were also performed in music halls and played in parlors across Canada. It is these songs from Canada's home front that tonight's presentation will explore. Throughout this presentation, you'll have the opportunity, as Pat mentioned, to view authentic sheet music and listen to original sound recordings. I hope that by appealing to the aural and visual senses, it will become clear that music was significant to the First World War experience for Canadians on the home front. The important role of music in wartime was highlighted through these words of J.W. Wallace in the October 1917 edition of the Canadian Music Trades Journal. And I'll read the quote. We have watched the feet of thousands go swinging down our streets, and always to the sound of music. Across the Atlantic, on through England, and up the torn roads of France, even to the crest of Vimy Ridge, those feet go swinging with music playing them on. The battle line of this war is not confined to the western or eastern or any other front. It passes through every home, every farm, every factory that is working in the great cause. And in all these places, music is a national necessity. Here Wallace acknowledges the widespread use of music during the First World War, drawing a connection between soldiers' marching songs and music played in Canada. War, whether at home or abroad, created an environment in which music could serve a vital purpose. To encourage sheet music and record sales, Wallace maintains a focus on the importance of music on the home front in particular. While this excerpt supports the position that music was a necessity of wartime, this presentation argues for the necessity of studying wartime music as a way of viewing or hearing the past. The wartime messages expressed in popular songs reflected the changing attitudes of Anglo-Canadians between 1914 and 1918. Through the lyrics, music, and cover art of popular songs, composers and publishers appealed to Anglo-Canadians with messages they believed would resonate with their audience for various purposes at different stages of the war. There are three central themes within popular songs on the home front that I identified through my research. Patriotic support for Britain and the Empire, Canadian national identity, and gendered notions of service and sacrifice. These themes prompted three central questions that guided this research. How was the wartime relationship between Britain, the Empire, and Canada represented in patriotic songs? In what ways did music construct a national Canadian identity during the war? And how were wartime gender roles expressed in popular songs, and for what purposes? The study of popular songs adds to our understanding of wartime culture by shifting the focus away from classical music to songs that reveal the popular discourse of the war as promoted by composers and publishers. Although these songs were not part of the official propaganda efforts led by the government, they represent the symbolic language of war that many Anglo-Canadians were subjected to and influenced by during the war. As for my sources, the main analysis was directed at the songs themselves, 
so the sheet music, cover art, and recordings. While thousands of songs were composed by and sung for civilians on the home front in Canada between 1914 and 1918, it's difficult to ascertain the exact number of songs produced. The collections I found from Library and Archives Canada, the University of Western Ontario, and McMaster University provided a sample of 130 songs composed in Canada during the war. Although these collections clearly do not include every song that was composed due to sheet music's ephemeral nature, they are representative of the types of messages Anglo-Canadians on the home front were exposed to throughout the war. The fact that they still exist in collections today, sometimes in multiples, suggests that they were more widely circulated and purchased at the time. And I'm happy to say that I've been able to add a few pieces of wartime sheet music to my own personal collection, and I've brought a few pieces here for you to view after my presentation tonight. Newspapers, trade journals, and archival documents shed light on the production and reception of popular songs within wartime Canada. National and local newspapers, as well as archival documents, provide evidence of the use of popular songs in recruitment efforts, an important purpose that music served during the war. The Canadian Music Trades Journal was published monthly throughout the war years by those in the music trade business, and it lists the titles of some 1,850 songs published between August 1914 and November 1918. The journal provides historians with a sense of the musical climate in Canada during the war. Before considering the songs themselves, I'd like to provide you with some background on the nature of the music industry in Canada leading up to and during the First World War. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the popularity of parlor music rose in Canada as pianos became more affordable for those of the middle class to purchase for their homes. Alongside the rise of parlor music was an increase in sheet music, as it was an easy and affordable way for songs to be distributed for playing within the home. The phonograph was another way to make music more accessible to the average person, particularly for those who could not afford to attend live concerts. In the pre-war period, the majority of the sheet music and records available in Canada were reissued pieces of European music for the Canadian market. Even the leading Canadian publishing company did not produce an abundance of Canadian goods prior to the war. The music industry grew tremendously during the war, highlighted by the explosion of popular songs on patriotic themes that occurred in the first few months. This impacted sheet music and record sales, which experienced significant sales increases. However, there were concerns over the quality of the popular songs that were being produced. An article in the Canadian Music Trades Journal expressed such concerns, and I quote, The present war has been productive of almost as many songs as casualties. How many casualties have been caused by the songs is not known. Some of the latter are veritable atrocities. Those in the music business addressed these issues by outlining strategies for composers and publishing companies to follow in order to make wartime profits on good quality sheet music. And I'll explain some of these strategies to provide an idea of the production process behind the songs. Composers were encouraged to target an audience of Canadians who could afford sheet music and ensure that the average person would understand the words used. Accordingly, the music needed to appeal to the average range of voice and playing ability. It was recommended that composers avoid putting too much emphasis on writing original music to accompany the lyrics because, quote, many of the most successful hits are merely rehashes of other hits with a little di different tempo or rhythm thrown in to disguise the relationship. If songwriters stray outside the plain familiar paths, they are likely to confuse the public. Publishers were directed to gauge the seriousness of the composers they dealt with and whether they would be committed to selling their product at all stages, because the process of turning a popular song into a success was costly. So for example, a first edition of 1,000 copies was published at a cost ranging between $60 and $75, 
There were costs associated with advertising for the songs in newspapers, and theater managers needed to be paid to allow the songs to be sung in their theaters. During the war, the popularity of songs and the sale of sheet music largely relied upon public performances at music halls or local recruiting events. Which brings me to one of the most significant uses for popular songs during the war, to encourage enlistment. The newspapers I examined, which were mostly from Ontario, describe performances by regimental bands and other performers. While it's impossible to locate every performance of music during the war, the articles offer an idea of how frequently popular songs were played over the course of the war. And I was able to map these performances using Google Maps to determine how the use of music changed over time and space. As you can see from this map, the vast majority of performances in Ontario were concentrated in Toronto and the surrounding area in 1915 and 1916 when the war was well underway and the military was actively seeking voluntary recruits since conscription was not enacted until late 1917. The language used in the newspaper articles to describe popular songs played by regimental bands and other performers also provides some indication of how music was received by Anglo-Canadians. In many cases, the audience was motivated to join in the singing at recruiting events and music hall performances. The fact that an audience knew the lyrics, or at least the chorus, reveals the popularity of a song. In addition to sing-alongs, audiences also danced to popular patriotic songs at more informal events and gatherings. During the First World War, the regimental band was a central feature of recruitment rallies, concerts, and parades. Brass and pipe bands played music in communities across Canada to encourage support of the war, recruit men for the military, and celebrate soldiers heading overseas. The overall atmosphere created by regimental bands through their playing of patriotic music was often cited as a mark of success at recruiting events. For example, an article about recruitment in the Port Arthur News Chronicle from the 11th of August, 1915, highlighted the local battalion's band. And I quote, The band of the 52nd Battalion is proving very effective as a recruiting medium. It has, during the past few days, helped to bring in a large number of recruits. On one day alone, after the band had been parading in the streets, 16 men enlisted. Although the song titles are not included in the article, it's significant that successful recruitment efforts in Port Arthur were attributed, at least in part, to the battalion band. Similar references to battalion bands in relation to recruitment were made in newspapers across Ontario. Some of the most well-attended wartime concerts included not only regimental bands, but also other performers and musicians. An article in the Northern Advance on the 30th of March, 1916, explained that a standing room only sign was displayed outside of the Opera House in Barrie about an hour before the concert began. The theater was packed to the utmost capacity, noted the article, with a thoroughly appreciative audience that gave the performers liberal applause for every number an encore being demanded. This article provides an idea of the messages the audience approved of by including a number of patriotic song titles like Charge of the Gordon Highlanders and the battalion's own regimental march. As a finale to the band's performance, members of the battalion sang a parodied version of We'll Never Let the Old Flag Fall, modified to We've Got to Let Our Mustache Grow. This indicates that the original version of the song was already well entrenched in wartime society. Parodied versions of songs typically emerged only after the originals achieved some degree of success. The audience would have a greater appreciation for the parodied version if they were familiar with the original. And I'll play We'll Never Let the Old Flag Fall for you in a few minutes. One of the most well-known performers of popular songs was a young girl, Mildred Manley, who was described in newspaper articles and on sheet music covers as Canada's greatest child vocalist. 
Manley often performed her father's music around Toronto at recruitment rallies and as part of vaudeville programs at prominent locations such as Massey Hall and the Royal Alexandra Theatre. According to many newspaper articles from the time, Manley's performances were well received by her audiences, suggesting that they approved not only of her singing, but also the messages contained in her father's popular songs. Keep the Manleys in mind as we turn to the songs, as their names will come up again. The relationship between Britain, the Empire, and Canada is one of the main themes of popular songs composed on the home front. From the early years of the war, there was an emphasis on the historic ties between Britain and Canada in order to encourage voluntary enlistment. The patriotic messages found in this group of songs were directed at Anglo-Canadians who were expected to show support for king and country in wartime. These songs primarily expressed loyalty to Britain and the Empire through emotive symbols in the lyrics and cover images. The music was carefully arranged by composers to include elements meant to incite patriotism. Patriotic songs were in high demand, particularly in the early years of the war. In the first five months, songs with titles that clearly expressed support for Britain and the Empire accounted for almost half of the total number of songs about the war composed in the same period. This number increased twofold for both 1915 and 1916 when patriotic songs about Britain and the Empire reached their peak. According to an article in the Canadian Music Trades Journal in November 1916, never in the history of the business has there been a time when patriotic records were demanded as they now are. And now for a few songs on patriotic themes. In August 1916, a crowd gathered each evening at the Canadian National Exhibition in Toronto for a military demonstration in front of the grandstand. A feature of the performance was a male quartet that emerged with megaphones singing We'll Never Let the Old Flag Fall beneath a large display of the Union Jack. In part because of this series of performances, sales of the song surpassed 28,000 copies as the exhibition came to a close, which was, according to the Canadian Music Trades Journal, undoubtedly one of the biggest boosts a song ever had in this city. The fact that the exhibition organizers selected this patriotic, made in Canada song suggests that they thought the imperial messages contained in the lyrics and the stirring martial music you're about to hear would be met with approval from a wartime audience. This original recording by Frederick Wheeler features bugle calls and references to many patriotic elements like the Union Jack and fighting for the king. Fall was deemed the most successful song ever written and published in Canada, and it received a wide audience. By the end of the war, it was claimed that, quote, there is no village or town in Canada in which it has not been heard. Another successful Anglo-Canadian popular song from the First World War was Good Luck to the Boys of the Allies, composed by Morris Manley in 1915. This marching song encouraged those on the home front to support enlistment and offered good luck to Johnny Canuck and all the Allies soldiers, such as those featured here on the sheet music cover. A distinguishing feature of the song that makes the British connection clear is the inclusion of the melody of God Save the King to accompany the lyrics God Save Our Gracious King. The recording of this song that you'll now hear is a popular wartime singer, Herbert Stewart. It also features a bugle call and drums, marking it clearly as a patriotic song in support of the war.
Stand by the Union Jack also explicitly supported Britain with prominent flag symbolism. As you can see, the cover features the Union Jack, as well as the Canadian soldier dressed in uniform, and the song is described as a marching song for Canadian soldiers. From the early months of the war, the song was recognized for its prominent message in support of the war. According to a report submitted in late 1914 by a committee of musicians in Winnipeg, the verses convey a fine Canadian and imperial sentiment, and the march is said to be good enough to make the chances good of having Stand By the Union Jack take the place of It's a Long Way to Tipperary among the boys from Canada. The version you'll hear now is not an original recording of the song, but was created more recently through the efforts of Dr. Jonathan Vance at the University of Western Ontario. The singer is Western alumna Kelsey Meredith, accompanied by pianist Debbie Grigg. The rest of the songs you'll hear are also by these performers. As you heard, the lyrics of the chorus emphasize the connection between Britain and Canada in the context of war by highlighting their common values. This song links liberty and the fight against tyranny with common symbols of the British Empire in an attempt to rouse Anglo-Canadians to war. The meaning of these lyrics is underlined by the musical accompaniment played as a spirited march throughout. This song is one that portrays Britain and the Empire as indistinguishable concepts, positioning Canada as supportive of upholding British values and, by extension, ensuring the continued strength of the Empire. The message of supporting Britain and the Empire was apparent in the lyrics, melody, and cover art of many Anglo-Canadian popular songs. They suggest that composers and publishers believed an emphasis on imperial ties would be a motivating force for enlistment and support of the war by Anglo-Canadians. While many patriotic songs composed during the First World War clearly identified an allegiance to Britain and the Empire, this message was not incompatible with the notion of an emerging Canadian identity. The war created an environment in which composers and publishers believed that messages of Canadian nationalism became increasingly necessary for garnering recruits and support for the war effort. There were efforts to establish a sense of Canadian identity through music by emphasizing common wartime values and national unity in the hopes of creating lasting popular songs. The earliest songs that expressed Canadian nationalism included symbols associated with Canada that were not related to the war, but were tied to the mythology of Canada's wilderness. One of the distinguishing features of Canada described in popular songs was the country's landscape. In the 19th and 20th centuries, Canada was often characterized by its cold northern climate, which it was believed played a vital role in creating strong and healthy citizens. So the strength of the nation was embodied in Canada's landscape. Many songs allude to Canada's vast territory by emphasizing that those from coast to coast supported the war and enlisted for service overseas. Another common element of popular songs used to establish a Canadian national identity was the symbol of the maple leaf. Although the current flag of Canada was not yet the symbol of the nation, the maple leaf was associated with Canada long before 1965. Similar to highlighting Canada's landscape, the focus on the maple leaf evoked notions of the famous Canadian wilderness. Many sheet music covers, such as those pictured here, incorporated Canadian imagery through use of the maple leaf. The maple leaf was one aspect that formed the distinctive image of Canadian soldiers. Many popular songs composed from 1915 onwards refer to the Canadian soldier as Johnny Canuck, the Canadian version of the British Tommy Atkins. Johnny Canuck, a national personification of Canada, first appeared in political cartoons in the late 19th century. 
He was often portrayed as a farmer or lumberjack, but was later characterized as a Canadian soldier. During the war, there was a common notion that the Canadian wilderness created the strong, self-reliant, effective Canadian soldier, and this was represented through song lyrics. The song that perhaps best characterized a Canadian national identity is I Love You Canada, composed by Morris Manley and Kenneth McInnes in 1915. The lyrics feature descriptions of the Canadian landscape and mention the maple tree, and the song contributes to an overall patriotic sentiment towards Canada. The cover features a colorful map of Canada, establishing the song as a Canadian tune with this recognizable image. The song was very successful and was ideal for sing-alongs, as the melody is simple and within range for the average person to sing, while the lyrics are overtly patriotic. The song is written from the perspective of a soldier thinking about everything he loves about home. It was unique for its time because there's a complete absence of British and Imperial symbols, with the focus remaining on Canada throughout. As the war continued and Canada engaged in battle across the Western Front, popular songs began to draw from wartime experiences to bring the country together as a nation. From 1917 onwards, songs were composed with titles that directly referenced battles the Canadians had fought in. This song, The Battle of the Somme, is a march composed by Arthur Wellesley Hughes in 1917. The cover art, as you can see, features two flags in the foreground framing a battle scene with Canadian soldiers charging forward in the fight. The scene depicted is quite realistic, likely owing to its appearance in a later stage of the war, as two soldiers appear to be lying on the ground with their arms outstretched towards their comrades in a call for help. This song drew attention to Canadian involvement in the Battle of the Somme, contributing to the discourse of Canada coming into its own during the First World War. In the later stages of the war, there were also patriotic songs that commended Canada's overall war effort. The Hearts of the World Love Canada, composed in 1918 by Gordon V. Thompson, makes no mention of Britain or the Empire when explaining that the world was indebted to Canada for its role in the war. While the chorus draws from the Canadian imagery that was more common in songs composed in the early years of the war, such as the prairies and stately trees, the verses make a clear connection to Canada's wartime role. The first verse thanks the khaki-clad men of Canada who were away trenching on fields in Flanders. The second verse even acknowledges the part that Canadian women played in the war effort. The perception that Canada's involvement in the war was highly regarded around the world created a sense of nationalism. Popular songs composed later in the war were able to draw from more concrete examples of the Canadian experience overseas, constructing a national identity that was more strongly tied to Canada's involvement in the war. Many of the Anglo-Canadian popular songs composed during the First World War expressed gendered notions of war. The lyrics and cover art reflected a clear set of expectations regarding men and women, with imagery that constructed the ideal masculine soldier in battle and the feminine woman on the home front. At the beginning of the war, there was a predominance of songs that emphasized the manliness of a strong fighting soldier in order to encourage enlistment. In the decades preceding the First World War, Anglo-Canadian men were expected to demonstrate a certain set of physical and moral qualities that were instilled in boys from a young age through schooling, cadet training, and sports. 
when war broke out, many saw the battlefield as a site for the ultimate test of manhood. Popular songs were one way in which the message of being manly and enlisting was promoted, predominantly through lyrics that described the qualities of brave men and emphasized the khaki uniform as a symbol of manliness. The song Soldier Lad, composed in 1914 by Charles Lorimer and W.H. Stringer, is an example of a march that highlighted elements of manliness to encourage Anglo-Canadian enlistment in the early years of the war. The lyrics emphasize many of the valued traits that men were supposed to display as soldiers, including bravery, pride, and loyalty. The song also encourages women to support men in the cause, as it's written from the perspective of a soldier's sweetheart. Women played a central role in recruiting men for the war, so their efforts were often featured in wartime discourse, including popular songs such as this one. As you'll hear in the chorus, the soldier's sweetheart praises him for enlisting for service, and she awaits his return. The pride expressed by the soldier's sweetheart in this song was likely intended to not only inspire Anglo-Canadian men to match this soldier's manliness by enlisting, but also to encourage women to openly praise those who actively supported the war. As the recruiting situation worsened from the fall of 1916 onwards, and battalions faced difficulties reaching full strength, popular songs became more direct and questioned the masculinity of men who had not enlisted. The song, There's a War On in Europe, composed in 1917, featured lyrics that were meant for Anglo-Canadian men who remained on the home front. The first verse speaks to such an audience. Were you ever in the war zone, all you that laugh and play? Did you never think of going and joining in the fray? Did you ever know the reasons why men have gone out there? Did you never think you ought to go out and do your share? This series of questions conveys a sense of disapproval towards the men who remained in Canada. The second verse continues with this line of questioning and goes so far as to accuse these men of cowardice with the final line, or is it that you're fearing the sound of those big guns? These verses were clearly composed with the intention of pressuring men on the home front to take up their place beside those who had already volunteered for battle. Popular songs about the wartime roles of women were also frequently composed, encouraging them to fulfill their feminine duties by contributing to the war effort in traditionally female ways and supporting the men in their lives to enlist. As the war continued, there was a steady increase in sentimental songs that attempted to console women on the home front by expressing a longing for the soldier's return and lamenting Canadian losses in battle. The lyrics assumed different perspectives from the soldier thinking about home to mothers and children waiting for the return of loved ones. Due to their storytelling nature and somber tone, sentimental songs were not marches, but ballads, sometimes composed as a waltz. The song, When Your Boy Comes Back to You, composed in 1916 by Gordon B. Thompson, encouraged a mother to cheer up, don't be blue, while waiting for her son to return. The song's message offered hope to mothers on the home front by continually emphasizing the song, Till Your Boy Comes Back to You. 
The cover of the sheet music further reinforces this sense of hope with an image of a soldier returning home to his mother, meeting her at the old garden gate, as promised in the lyrics. According to the Canadian Music Trades Journal, the message portrayed through the lyrics and cover art of this song resonated with Anglo-Canadians. An article from October 1916 notes that the song reached sales of 54,000 since the 6th of July 1916. As casualties amassed on the Somme battlefields, Anglo-Canadian women on the home front likely turned to popular songs like this one to provide them with a sense of hope and comfort. In some cases, popular songs also depicted women playing an active role in the war as nurses. While this wartime image of women positioned them outside of the private sphere, nursing was still a traditionally feminine role. Songs about nurses not only recognized their efforts, but also emphasized the persisting need for nurses later in the war. The song Goodbye Girls, composed by Morris Manley in 1918, tells the story of a Red Cross nurse, Mary Brown. She's pictured here on the sheet music cover, waving farewell to her friends in Canada. This nurse has a well-kept appearance and conforms to pre-war notions of femininity while participating in this wartime role overseas that brings her more prominently into the public sphere. The second verse highlights the view that women also had an important role to play in wartime. Please come and help the cause. You are wanted every day. We need the girls as well as men. This war, it must be won. It's up to one and all to help the man behind the gun. While most popular songs discussed the accepted roles for women in wartime as homemakers and nurses, the song, Why Can't a Girl Be a Soldier, by Lindsay E. Perrin, reveals another perspective on the war. The song's lyrics highlight many gendered aspects of war, including relationships between soldiers and the women they left behind, the ideal qualities for a soldier to possess, and the importance of women maintaining their femininity. As you'll hear, the chorus argues that women could contribute to the war as soldiers because they can carry a gun good as any mother's son. These lyrics are clearly written from the perspective of a woman on the home front. The song suggests that some women felt they should be allowed to contribute more to the war in roles beyond those on the home front and their traditional roles as nurses. By challenging the accepted roles of, for women in wartime with light-hearted lyrics accompanied by upbeat music, this song set itself apart from others at the time that often conformed to gender norms in Anglo-Canadian society. Despite the view this song represented, wartime roles continued to be assigned along typical gendered lines in Canada. I will conclude by bringing us back to this quote from J.W. Wallace. His words should now have more meaning for you in light of my discussion of wartime music in Canada. Popular songs were among those played for marching soldiers swinging down our streets. They were performed during recruitment rallies, local concerts, church services, and on every farm, every factory. Perhaps the most widespread use of popular songs throughout the war was within the home. Composers created songs on different themes that featured various forms of musical accompaniment to appeal to such an array of purposes during the war. Music, then, was not only a significant part of wartime experiences for soldiers fighting overseas, but was also a national necessity for those on the home front. Thank you.
you very much. So uh, I will open the floor up for anyone who has questions. Yes? Yes, um, the modern Canadian Army, whether on the march or in the pub, do they sing anything? Or they have their iPhones. I, I'm, listening. <laughs> I'm doing it privately. I'm, I'm a member of a group. That's actually a really great point. I haven't really uh, looked much into that. I do have an uncle in the military, though, so maybe I'll uh, start by asking him. Um, but yeah, no, I think you bring up a great point that uh, technology definitely plays a role in uh, how music might be incorporated into the Army today. I remember about the Russian Army a few generations ago, when the knee came on the march, the order would go out, singers to the front. Okay. <laughs> Meaning, they all sang in the men will listen as they're marching. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, I think it's similar to you hear stories about, you know, bagpipers le leading their men over the top uh, during the First World War and the Second World War as well. There's songs or uh, stories like that. So, uh, along a, a similar line as that. Thank you. Oh, uh, we'll go here. Yes. So, um, how did you locate the original? Yeah, so uh, Western and then also uh, McMaster has uh, quite a, a large sheet music collection at their archive. And then also I went to Library and Archives Canada and was able to get original recordings there. Um, the ones that you hear here uh, that are original, they were actually on YouTube. So if you want to look them up after, you can do that as well. And the quality, considering it's been 100 years, uh, is pretty good. Sarah, can you discuss a little bit about the growth of publishing of music? Because prior to the First World War, I don't think there was much publishing of Canadian music. Yes. Some very familiar names were listed as publishers there. Yeah, for sure. So, um, speaking more about prior to the war, so specifically uh, in Canada, as I mentioned, and I can go a little bit more into detail, um, Music was often European music that was then taken and reissued either uh, as sheet music or recordings uh, for the Canadian market. And so there weren't very many uh, original Canadian songs. And so uh, the First World War really sees an explosion, as I, I mentioned, uh, of sheet music recordings as the technology sort of improves over time uh, and from looking in the Canadian Music Trades Journal you can really see that the titles go from uh, very few titles especially popular music so I saw a shift from a focus mostly on classical music or European classical music to including more of these uh, I should really say North American because there is a very uh, big American influence on the Canadian music industry um, the one uh, publishing company in particular that uh, published a lot of these songs was the Anglo-Canadian Music Publishing Company, and even that company prior to the war didn't have very many actual Canadian um, songs. It was, again, reissued from the European market. Yes? Uh, Sarah, uh, the last piece that you uh, talked about uh, why can't a girl be a soldier? Yes. This is the fact that protest song against established attitudes. Um, do you have any idea uh, who, when, and where that was ever sung? Um, I did not have, uh, that did not come up in any of the newspaper articles that I looked at. Um, and if I go back uh, two slides or three slides. Um, it's an, it's an independent uh, publishing company, and I can't see there's, is it Godrich? Is that what it says? It's really small. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so again, I think it would be a pretty local, I don't know how widespread it was, and there's actually no date uh, included in the piece of sheet music. Um, I found it on uh, the Wartime Canada website, which is created uh, at Western, and they guessed 1916, um, but I'm not really sure how they came to that conclusion, but at some point during the war. Yes? How did you get interested in the subject? 
Great question. Uh, so when it came time for me to propose a topic for my master's research, um, I had previously done a lot of research and taken courses in the First World War, so that was certainly an interest of mine. And I had also taken a course on uh, the Vietnam War, and when it came time to writing my uh, final thesis, I looked at protest music. Um, and then that was sort of the first time that I ever thought of using music as a source or a window into the past. And so I decided to combine those interests and uh, propose this as my master's research. And it's something that hasn't really been focused on very much. Uh, Tim Cook, who I'm sure many of you are familiar with, uh, has done a lot of research but on uh, music sung by soldiers in the trenches as part of this trench culture that emerged. Um, but I wanted to look at songs on the home front. And so that's what I did. Music is also a passion of mine. I've been playing the piano since I was very young. Uh, so I was able to combine my passions of history and music. All right, well, thank you very much again. <laughs> This has been another in our series of webcasts produced by the Royal Canadian Military Institute in Toronto as a public educational service. You can find news of upcoming events and links to our webcast archives at www.rcmi.org. On behalf of the RCMI, this is Eric Morse saying goodbye for now and thank you for joining us.